All right, welcome everyone to our LFBC worship and sermon time. Uh, we're still in a state of global crisis, we understand that. We, like you, wish that we could all be together once again fellowshipping in God's house with God's people because we love you so much and we just miss each and every one of you. But we're going to have another time of recorded sermon uh, that will be on Facebook and on YouTube uh, Sunday morning. And so I hope that you enjoy it. I hope that you will sit down with your families and just enjoy that time of song and worship. At this time, we're going to bring our worship leader, Miss Nikki Debman, up to the podium. And we're going to, she's going to lead us in song. Miss Nikki. So glad to be with everybody today. Um, I think in times like this, I think I've used the word I way too much lately. I'm thinking a lot about me and mine. Um, I think it's a great time to look to Jesus instead, look to the cross. Um, so I hope this song blesses you.
thank you so much, Miss Nikki. She's such a blessing here at LFBC. And there again, I just want to welcome each and every one of you to LFBC time of worship here. I know that this is recorded and we, we love you guys and we're hoping that you will really spend time with your family over the next few weeks because it will take some time uh, for this too to pass. I know the governor just issued another order yesterday, a stay at home order. And so it doesn't look like that we're gonna be able to come back into corporate worship anytime for at least two to three to four more weeks. And so we've had to all kind of change the way we do things. And one of the things we've had to change is the way that we do corporate worship. Now, one of the things I want to talk about here today is that being stuck at home right now, as most of us are and most of us are going to be, might affect our corporate worship in a negative way. But it should affect our personal worship in a positive way. Now listen to what I just said. I know that being stuck at home and having to stay at home order, it does affect our corporate worship in a negative way. But oh, hallelujah, it can affect our personal worship and should affect it in a positive way. The fact is, just because we can't meet together corporately is no reason that our walk in righteousness cannot still flourish. Amen? I know that you're amen to me from home. There's no reason that our walk in righteousness cannot still flourish. In the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew, it's where we find the Sermon on the Mount. And at the first of this sermon, Jesus gives his followers a list of ways to be blessed. And they're better known as the Beatitudes. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew, chapter 5. And we're going to be in verse 6. And as I said last time, if you would like to, if you're at home and you've got your family together, I would like for you to go ahead and stand as we read God's holy, perfect, precious, and authoritative word. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, and the word of God says this, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we come to you this morning. Father, as we go out across Facebook and YouTube and people that are watching all over, Lord God, and we, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to be able to reach people in this technological era. And Lord God, we sure do miss corporate worship. I sure do miss loving on those that you have brought to me and allow me to be the pastor of, Father. And Lord God, I know that those at LFBC miss their family, their church family, their corporate church family here, Lord God. But oh God, you're trying to show us something, Father. Lord God, let us be on our knees and let us be seeking you in all things that we do so we can see what it is that you want for us to do, want for your people to do. Father, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. Now... When we put this verse in context with the lives that these Jews were living under Roman oppression, we can better see why Jesus feels the need to encourage these disciples with his words of blessings. These, these Jews were under such oppression by the Romans. Many of them had no food. Many of them were struggling in all ways. Plus, they were under the oppression there of the Romans themselves, even though we are not dealing with with an authoritative regime, with the army's heavy hand down upon us, we are dealing with an invisible enemy that has many people depressed, many people anxious, and it has many people scared. In many ways, we're just like these Jews were. They, under this Roman oppression, they were worried about where their next meal was going to come from. They were worried about whether they was going to be hurt or imprisoned. They had the heavy hand of the Roman army down upon them. And so many times, much like us today, we feel this same way with this invisible enemy that we're dealing with. It has its hand of oppression upon us, and we're anxious about things. We're even scared about what the future might hold. 
just like the disciples Jesus was ministering to, we also can receive much comfort in times of despair if we will just listen to, hallelujah, and obey the almighty word of God. Amen. Now, let's go ahead and take a deeper look at our text. And LFBC people, you'll know what I'm going to talk about next. If you like to take notes, go ahead and you can write this down. What does it mean to be blessed? So that's the question that I want us to talk about first, looking at our text. What does it mean to be blessed? Blessed, right, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, so they shall be satisfied, or they shall be filled. What does this word blessed mean? Well, dictionary.com defines blessed as this, a special favor, mercy, or benefit the blessings of liberty, a favor or gift bestowed by God, thereby bringing happiness. And lastly, listen to this, the invoking of God's favor upon a person. Hallelujah. Blessed means the invoking of God's favor upon a person. So we can see here that being blessed literally means to have the special favors, hallelujah, of God bestowed upon your life. That's what blessings mean. That's, that's how we look at this word blessed here in our text. The special favor of God put upon your life. This invoking of God's favor upon a person. Now, for those who follow Jesus to the mountain to hear him preach the Sermon on the Mount, this word blessed would have had significant meaning, especially with all the sickness and oppression that they were dealing with at this time, as I said earlier. They were dealing with such oppression, such, such sickness, many times famine in the land. And so this word blessed would have had a significant meaning. We too are being oppressed by an invisible enemy that is causing much sickness, an enemy that is causing much death, an enemy that is causing anxiety around our world today, causing us to be anxious and scared, as I said earlier, causing sickness, causing death. The Jews would have understood what this meant as we are starting to see it around our world today. Now, for nine verses in chapter 5, Jesus tells us how we can have the special favors of God bestowed upon our lives. But verse 6, now, now listen to this. This is why I believe God laid this verse on my heart. But verse 6 seems to be somewhat of a foundational attribute that every Christian should have that the rest of these blessed verses flow out of. Let's take a look at what I'm talking about. Secondly, write this down. What does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Think about that. We just heard what it means to be blessed. The invoking of God's favor upon someone's life, upon a person's life. So now we're, we want to talk about what does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Because it says blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So what does that look like? Well, first let's take a look at what this word righteousness means. Now, I want you to follow with me real closely here what this word righteousness actually means. Now, in Paul's writings, he uses the word righteousness many times to explain salvation or justification. But in Matthew's writing here, what we're talking about here today, we see that it is meant more as to live for God. So not necessarily the way that Paul uses it in many of his writings about salvation or justification, but here it's used more as how we live for God, living our lives for God, living out a godly life. We grow in sanctification when we are daily trying to live out a life that is pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. We grow in sanctification. We grow in our walk with God when we better live out daily what God would have us to do. Trying to live a life that is pleasing to our Lord Jesus Christ. We see this example 
in other verses in Matthew, Matthew 5, 10 even states this, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus blesses those who are persecuted for living for him. So we see this as this righteousness is a living for him righteousness. It's living out a righteous life. What is a righteous life? A life that is lived, hallelujah, for the Lord Jesus Christ. When you are saved, you are expected to live out a righteous life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what Matthew is talking about here. In this earth, that's what our Lord Jesus Christ is saying here in our text. 2 Timothy even talks about this as well in 2.12 when it states, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer, listen to that, will suffer persecution. We just saw that Jesus blesses those who are persecuted for living for him. And now 2 Timothy says, Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Those who try to live for Christ. So we see that the righteous here in our text deals more with sanctification than it does justification. Living for the Lord. Amen? Living for the Lord. How are we living, Christians? How are we living our life? Our Lord and Savior here says, Blessed, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we see what this righteousness means for us in our text. So then, what does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? Here in the Western world, the world we live in as Americans, we say that we are hungry and thirsty if we go more than a few hours without a snack or even something to drink. But that is not what Jesus meant here in our text. I was thinking of a funny story when I was putting this together. You know, I, I, try, I usually eat about five or six times a day. And every time I get ready to eat, I always say to myself, well, I'm getting hungry. I truly do not know what it means to be hungry. If you're eating five and six times a day, you do not know what it means to be hungry. But that's how I answer myself, or that's, that's the word choice that I use when I have an appetite for some food. But that is not what Jesus meant here in our text when he says hunger and thirst. That is not an example of the severity, hallelujah, of these two words, not at all. That's not an example of what Jesus Christ in our text is trying to tell those listeners there, those hearers there at the Sermon on the Mount, what the word hunger and thirst means. Not what we or most of us would consider hungry and thirsty. The original hearers of these words would have known exactly what it meant to be hungry and thirsty physically. But Jesus was using these words to make a spiritual point, right? They, they would have understood. They, they were under the oppression of the Romans. They, they had a lack of food. Many of them didn't know where they would get their next meal from possibly, right? They, they knew what it meant to be hungry or to be thirsty, but Jesus was using these words to make a spiritual point. We have people all over this world today who go days and even weeks without eating or drinking very little. Many of you have been on mission trips to some third world countries and you'll see families and children who absolutely are starving to death. You can turn on your television. It used to be very common to see children in Ethiopia with swollen stomachs, so much pain, so much anguish because they were malnourished. They were hungry. They had no food. They didn't have any clean drinking water. We, we see that all over the world today where they have very little, even here in our own country, many times the richest country on the planet, they know what true hunger and thirst is. These two words, hunger and thirst, represent an uncontrollable, hallelujah, desire and a longing to be filled. You can better believe that when we talk about these children, as I just mentioned, there is an uncontrollable desire 
to take in nourishment. There is an uncontrollable desire to get clean water and to get food to be filled because they have been hungry for so long. We have people in our own country that I know that are that way and we come across them. I, we've been so blessed. Some of you might know what hunger feels like. Some of you might know what thirst feels like. I can only I can only talk about it in, in just certain little aspects that if I had to go too long without eating one day, I might get a little bit of a headache. I might get a little bit weak. I might get a little bit parched in my mouth. And so that to me is hunger and thirst. But these would have known exactly what these two words represented, an uncontrollable desire and longing to be filled what hunger and thirst means. Do we hunger and thirst to live for Jesus the way a starving child hungers for his next meal, do we? We should. Do we know what hunger is? Do we know what thirst is? Do we hunger and thirst for the Word of God? Do we hunger and thirst to live for God in righteousness the way a starving child hungers and thirsts for food and drink. We should know what that feels like. During this time of global crisis, we're being forced to refocus our priorities. Maybe we as Christians should take this time to, to possibly reevaluate our level of hunger and our level of thirst or the lack thereof. For the one who has given us all things, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe, just maybe, we need to refocus our priorities. Maybe that's what God is showing us during this time of crisis. Are you really hungry? Are you really thirsty? That is something that we can do in our personal worship. I know that our corporate worship has been affected ne negatively, but our personal worship, we've been forced to be at home with our families, and our personal worship can grow if we'll hunger and thirst after righteousness like a starving child hungers for food. Look at what Jesus says will happen to those who live Passionately, And that's what we're talking about. Hunger and thirst. It's a passion. Passionately desiring, longing for. Look what Jesus says will happen to those who live passionately for him. The word of God here in our text, it says, They, hallelujah, shall be filled. Amen? They shall be filled. That's what our Lord and Savior here, the author, says will happen to those who hunger and thirst to live for God. He says, they shall be filled. Now, the Greek word for filled literally means this, to eat until you are completely full, hallelujah, and satisfied. That's what this word filled in the Greek, in the original text means. That's the meaning of it, right? Your Bible translation might say satisfied, the King James says, filled. Jesus says, I will bless you with fullness, hallelujah, and satisfaction if you will hunger and thirst to live for me. Wow. Wow. Can you believe that? Can you imagine that? Our glorious Savior says... I will bless you with fullness and satisfaction if you will hunger and thirst to live for me. What better promise is there from a mightier God than any? Our Lord Jesus Christ says, I will bless you. I will fill you 
to the fullest. I will satisfy your every want, your every desire, your every need. I will be the manifestation and the satisfaction of all those things if you will just hunger, hallelujah, thirst to live for me. That's what Jesus is telling us. That's what he wants from those who are called by his name. Dear ones, I'm not going to keep you long. As we close, I would encourage you to take this time at home to reassess. Now listen to this. I encourage you to take this time at home to reassess your relationship with Jesus Christ. You have the time. The governor has ordered everybody to stay at home who does not have some type of essential job that they must do. Refocus on your relationship. Reassess your relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you to pray for your hunger and thirst to live for him to be increased, right? You're looking for something to pray for in the mornings. You're looking for something to pray for in the afternoon, something to pray for at night. I would pray for your hunger and your thirst to live out a godly life, to live for the one who saved you, to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for that to be increased. That's what we want as Christians. We want to live each day to the fullest for him. We want to live a life of sanctification daily looking more and more like Christ. Is that what your life looks like? Is that what your life looks like now? Then maybe it's time to reassess your relationship with Jesus Christ. And for the lost person watching this sermon wherever from Facebook, YouTube, wherever you're finding it. I want you to know this. Beyond a shadow of a doubt on the authority of God's word, lost person, I want you to know this, that God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die on a cross, on a cruel Roman cross, so that you could believe on him as your Lord and Savior, hallelujah, and you too could be saved. That's for the lost person watching here today. God loves you. The God of the universe loves you. The God who spoke everything into existence and sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cruel Roman cross, hallelujah, loves you. So you could believe on his son and have eternal life and be saved. Now, as we have a time, we're going to hear a little bit of music in the background. And I want to do this to that lost person I just spoke of and I'm speaking to. If you would like to accept Jesus as your Savior today, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now, right here, where you're at. I want you to, I want you to close your eyes. You can get down on your hands and knees, whatever you want to do. But I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the almighty divine son of God. I believe that you came to this earth to die on a cross for my sins. I believe that you rose bodily from the grave. And I believe that you sit at the right hand of the Father to forever make intercessor for me. And Lord Jesus, I believe right now in you. I invite you into my heart and I believe on you for my eternal salvation. Jesus, please be my Lord and Savior. Amen. Bible says if you prayed this prayer 
and you believed on Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation, that you're saved. Now, if you did this today, if you prayed to invite Jesus into your heart, and if you prayed to be saved today, then I want you to private message me on Facebook so we can discuss some of the things that we need to do next. I'd be more than happy to disciple you. I'd be more than happy to take this journey with you. And also, I want to just say this. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the family of God. And for you Christians, to all who are watching, especially my LFBC family, I want you to know that if that's not the way you've been living, if you've not been living with a hunger and thirst to live for God's Word, then I want you to repent right here today and turn away from whatever it is that you're doing that's keeping you from it. And I want you to live your life for Jesus once again. Until next time, stay safe. I love you. And God bless.